the first couple of episodes will be kind of basic. I'll just like say that right now. Uh, we're going to go into more advanced topics in uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, the point of this video or this live stream is not really meant to be like a replacement of the actual training videos we have on our YouTube page, uh, but it'll be a good supplemental uh, education tool. So if you're not familiar with Hog at all, you really should check out our YouTube videos and uh, learn from, from that as well. So we're going to kind of focus on little topics uh, throughout the console within each little uh, live stream. So the first one is going to be an introduction to the console talk about patching and little shortcuts and things like that to uh, make yourself hopefully a better programmer. Uh, so whether you are an experienced programmer or you've never touched the console before, uh, our hope is that you will learn something from this live stream. Uh, we do really encourage feedback. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, we can answer them either verbally or we can answer them in the Q&A there. Um, <clears throat> And uh, all the downloaded, all the files are free to download. You should have gotten the little email that gives you a link to download all these files. So you should have a uh, show file and a, a capture visual visualization file that you can download. You don't need any, you don't need to pay for anything. You don't need any kind of software. You just basically run it. Uh, you do need to download Hogwarts PC to load the show file though. Um, so yeah, Megan, anything else before we kind of? Nope. Um, fair warning, I do have allergies, so just if you hear me sniffle or sneeze or cough, it is allergies. It is pollen season in Texas, and it decided to rain last night, so just fair warning that it's just allergies here. So with that being said, Noah, let's hop in. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and wait for Hot Core PC to reset here, and then I'm just going to show you guys really quickly on the right-hand screen. Uh, there is a, in your webinar files, you should have gotten this uh, folder if you looked at your email. In that uh, webinar files, there's lots of various different resources. Oops, Hogwarts oh, PC is not going to. Hogwarts oh, PC is getting in the way. That's okay. Uh, basically, what you need is this capture exe file if you're on Windows, and you're going to need this 313.1 capture app file if you're on Mac. And you will also need the bin file in the same uh, location as these two files. Uh, and then if you want to follow along with the show file, uh, we do have a show file available. That's where this little uh, live webinar base show file is. Uh, we're going to start from scratch today, but for all future episodes, we'll actually be going from that uh, base show file. Yeah, we're going to be running release software, so 3.13.1. And everything that we're going to go over will work on 3.12. But we're going to be running the latest and greatest of 313.1. I was just reading some of the chat. Um, the show file should be backwards compatible, if I remember correctly. So we'll just we'll work with that also. Um, but if you're not on 313.1, make sure to update, guys. It just makes it a little bit easier to just use the same software version and get some of the uh, new stuff from 312 to 313. So a couple of things to point out, uh, we are running nano mode. So what that does is that switches hog for PC to one uh, monitor and also switches it over to four in cover mode. So if you have like a hog or a nano hog, hedgehog or a roadhog, it'll switch it over to four in cover mode instead of five. Uh, we are also running a visualizer stream. So if you do want to follow along with the visualizer uh, in future videos, you do need to have this little box checked here. Uh, we're going to launch into a brand new show. I'm going to go ahead and label that. Let me sign this really quickly. And Megan, do you want to talk about the uh, kind of the layout of the desk? Yeah. So before we get started too much, guys, let's talk a little bit about the lay of the land. Um, so you have the big play, pause, back, skip back, skip forward buttons. To the those buttons and to the left is kind of like our playback section. So anything that's going to control cue lists, scenes. Any type of playback object is usually controlled from the left hand side of the playbacks of your front panel. Now, on the right hand side, that's kind of where all the magic happens, considering programming, stuff like that. Um, so, in the middle there, you have your numeric keypad. That's what you use to select fixtures. Um, then, from your numeric keypad, once you have fixtures selected, you kind of go into your fixed kind keys. So, what type of parameter you want to control. 
Then from there, once you have the type of parameter selected with your fixed kind keys, is usually your workflow leads you to your encoder wheels to actually change those parameters, uh, to actually change the parameters. Then to the left of the numeric keypad, you have your utility keys. That's setup, go to, set, pig, fan, open. Those are just some different utility keys. We'll get into what all of those actually do in a little bit. Um, made probably a different video, to be honest. Um, and then right above that, we have our action keys. So these are different actions you can perform on the desk, like record, merge, update, copy, move, delete. And then right above that, you have your object keys. Your object keys are different show objects. So your pages, your lists, scenes, macros, that kind of thing. Now to the right of your numeric keypad, you have your um, you have your command kind keys. These are user-defined keys, and I believe we have almost a whole video dedicated to them. Uh, so that's definitely going to be something we talk about in a later live stream. And then next to that, we have our trackball. If you're on a full-size console with full bore 4 or hog 4, or hog 4, 18, or you have a Kensington model trackball plugged in, then your trackball can be used to control pan and tilt of the desk. Uh, I mean, of the fixtures, which is really nice. Next to that trackball is the intensity scroll wheel. Your intensity scroll wheel, of course, you push up, it, it increases intensity. Pull down, it's going to decrease intensity. And then you have those buttons above and below that intensity scroll wheel, and those are really nice um, intensity buttons. So the top one push is plus 10%, and the bottom one is minus 10% intensity. And that's really it for the, for the front panel. So we're going to go to the display now just to kind of go give a little bit of how Noah has it set up in nano mode here. So if you look at towards the top from palettes to view, that's really the views toolbar. If you're on a full size console with two desks, with two displays, it will be split from the view over to the left. That goes to the left hand display and then the rest of the buttons go to the right hand display. Um, but your views toolbar are views that are pretty, oh, sorry guys. Views toolbar is used to quickly recall your views, so different layouts of windows. Then to the right of that, you have where help begins. Help's gonna open your manual. So that's just gonna be the onboard manual for whatever software version you're on. So if you scroll all, there's no search on this manual. So to find anything in the desk, the easiest way is to scroll all the way down and then go to the index. And your index is going to take you to a list of topics that are talked about in the console and it has a bunch of links. So then you can go and click on the link and it'll take you to that section in the manual. Um, and that's really the best way to navigate the manual when you're on the desk. Now, uh, now that we kind of talked about the manual, the next couple buttons are gonna be our window control buttons. So starting with copy, that's going to duplicate whatever your active window is. So since the programmer was selected, when we hit copy, it just made another copy of that window. And then size is going to go quarter, half, quarter, half, full sizes. So as you have a window selected, you just keep hitting size. It's going to rotate it around the screen. Move would move this window from one display to another. So, the, so really, if, since we don't have a second display open, it's not going to do anything right now. But if we did, we would see it go from this display to another display. Max is going to toggle from full size screen back to its previous size before it hit before you hit max. So if you hit max again, it'll go back to normal or go back to what it was previously. Focus is going to toggle what windows actually in focus. So if we have multiple windows open, you hit focus, it changes what your active window is. And if that active window ended up being buried, it'll bring it forward in front of all the windows. Then you have unlock, which is going to allow you to Click and, drag, click and drag the windows exactly like you do on Mac or PC to resize and place the windows wherever you want. So you're not stuck to that quarter, half, quarter, half, quarter, half full system that we do by default. And now that we've made a mess of our, win of our display, it's probably time to close some windows. So over at the far right, there's a close button that'll close your windows one at a time. And then close all closes all the windows at once. Uh, now at the bottom of your display, you have the slot toolbar. Your slot toolbar, that's this big gray empty bar here, will start populating once we have fixtures selected. And these are going to be like slotted parameters. So like your color wheels, your gobo wheels, prisms, anything that the anything that's like kind of slotted on a wheel inside the fixture itself. 
Um, and then below that, you have these four black bars. Those are going to tell you what your encoder wheels are actually controlling. So if you need to control like pan or tilt, you'll see which bar pan is on. And then that corresponds to that encoder wheel. So the first one goes to the first encoder wheel, second to the second encoder wheel, third to the third, and fourth to the last encoder wheel. If you're not in nano mode, you'll see that there's a fifth bar and a fifth encoder wheel in your front panel. Um, below that, we have the command line and status bar. And then below that, we have our, our playback bar. The playback bar is going to show you what is being controlled by each of the faders. And then you have your soft keys here, the select, segment, touch, suck, out, all that good stuff. And yeah, and that's really kind of the lay of the land. Now that we've done, we've done a little bit of the lay of the land, um, let's jump into patching and get some fixtures patched and the fit and the visualizer going. So to patch, we have to go into the fixture window. So to do that, we can either hit setup and then patch or my favorite way, and I believe it's also Noah's favorite way, is to just click and hold in the middle of an empty display and that's going to open a menu. And then you can select fixtures from this menu. Noah, why don't you walk through adding fixtures? Sure. So uh, something that's a little different about our console is you actually have to add fixtures before you can like assign channels or patch information. Now, there's other consoles out there that it kind of works the other way around. I like our way. Uh, so to add fixtures to your show, you hit that add fixtures button at the top. Let me switch this over so you can see my full screen. There we go. Uh, it will take a second to open up the library for the first time. Uh, there's about 17,000 different fixture personalities in our library as it stands. So uh, a lot of fixtures. And here we are in this window. And there's a search function in the console. It does search by the fixture name. It doesn't search by the manufacturer name. So like if I were to type in ETC, it's going to find fixtures that have ETC in the name. It's not going to search by the manufacturer ETC. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a uh, nine soul spot 2000. So I'm going to type in 2000. And then I'm going to go to the high end systems folder you find the soul spot 2000 and I'm going to type nine. Uh, a very common thing that a lot of people tend to do is they'll type in a number and we'll just press OK. Uh, unfortunately, what that does, though, is you actually haven't entered in your number. And so they'll hit OK and then nothing happens. It's a very common thing I hear people talk about. Uh, so once again, I'll do that and actually show you the kind of proper way to do this. Let's go into the high end folder. Uh, you hit nine, there's two things. You can either hit enter or you can hit the down arrow key and that actually enters in the command for that number. And then I'll press apply. And then you can see in the background of the screen here, we've added nine uh, solo spot 2000s. I'm gonna go ahead and add in the rest of the fixtures that are gonna be in our visualizer file in the meantime. Uh, Megan, if you wanna maybe look at some questions and if you have any questions for in the meantime, guys, feel free to ask them. Yeah, well, Noah's doing this. I can field any questions. I know someone in the chat mentioned a dotted user number question. We are going to talk a bit more about dotted user numbers when we start talking about selecting fixtures. Um, and we're going to do some examples on how to renumber using dotted fixture number dotted user numbers as well. Um, but if you have questions and they're quick, I can probably I can answer them. But just so you know, we are going to discuss them a bit later. There uh, is a, a folder for generic items. So if you look at the top, it's actually not under G. It's actually the very, very top of the window. There's a generic folder. So if you wanted to add in a generic fixture, uh, you can do that here. Uh, for example, the dimmer, I'm gonna add eight dimmers. So just a zero to 255, zero to 100% value. That can be found in here. Uh, there's a lot of also generic uh, RGB uh, fixtures. So I'm gonna add an RGB bar, eight cell. I'm going to add one of those. And while Noah's doing that, um, Timothy, I just saw your question. Is there a way to make button screen window bigger on Hogwarts PC? No, uh, you might want to change your application scaling and the resolution on your computer because we, the app itself is a fixed size. So without actually scaling that application inside Windows, it's not going to scale. Uh, so you'll want, you'll want to check that there. All right, I got everything out of it. Um, cool. 
And one sec. So hold on, we got another question. Why do we have to add pixel map layers in the patch? Why can't you do direct, do it directly in the plot? Um, because the pixel map layer is ultimately treated as a fixture. So it makes sense to add it when you're adding it in your show file. We don't do it besides changing the fixtures user number at that point. We don't do anything else with it inside the inside the fixture window though. Um, and then Alan, so with your question about dotted user numbers, let's wait till we talk about that because we're going to show, I'm going to show you how to, uh, we're actually going to walk through that a little bit. Uh, but we will go back to, and I will directly answer how to do that. Um, why not both in the patch and in the plot? I can put that fixture request in. Uh, I mean, I can put that feature request in. We can definitely log that as a feature request. It's just something that we've just kept separate because you always add fixtures inside the fixture window versus adding them in other places. But I can put that feature request in. I could see how it could speed up if it's in the plot in case you forgot how to, you forgot to actually add the fixtures. And I'll make that note. Um, best place to submit a uh, feature request because someone just sent me a message uh, is our forms go under our forms there's a request mm -hmm. and features and requests or something like that uh, that's the best place to uh, request uh, any kind of features that you want in the console make sure that is the actual best place to actually put requests in um, i was just answering the question so i made the note here uh, make sure guys all your questions and your answers go to your go to the q a so that we def we don't miss them for sure because i see some of them going to the chat um does the fixture pad okay so i'm going to we're going to walk through how to rename fixtures and the how to re, re how to change user numbers and then after we change user numbers we'll we'll field some more of these questions in here all right so let's walk through how to change user numbers like i just said so how so if we wanted to change user numbers you have to click and drag or select the cell for the fixture number you want to change so if we wanted to change all the soul spot 2000s in here we'd click and drag on them hit set and once you hit set it's going to pop up with this box which you can then say what is the starting user number for this range so with this starting user number let's just name it 201 at this point so hit 201 enter and when we do that, it's going to give this range of, of numbers for these fixtures. You'll notice that when once we type in these numbers, there's an asterisk here. The asterisk means that there's a duplicate user number. Uh, so as soon as you see that there's a duplicate user number, we'll make the asterisk appear. By default, Hog's not going to give you uh, duplicate user numbers. We give you unique user numbers just to help speed it up in case you don't have time to actually give user numbers to everything. Um, so let's go ahead and renumber those back to one through nine. So just click and drag on all the cells, hit set, and then hit one, enter. So it's just that starting number, and then enter, and it renumbers them. And that's how it's done. Well, Noah's going to go through and renumber some of these just to be a little bit easier for selecting, so that since this is usually our training rig, we're already used to some numbers. Um, we answered that one. So does the patch... Does the fixture patch to its largest default parameter? No, so that's going to be based on what mode you actually patch. The fixture, so we don't default to whatever mode you want. You actually have to specify in the fixture schedule what your default parameter is. Is there a patch list somewhere? What do you like a list of fixtures that we support in our fixture library? Is there a patch list somewhere? I'm going to guess is this a list of fixtures that we have in our fixture library? Yes, uh, at highend.com. Um, and then underneath support and product downloads and fixture library, we have a list of what our fixtures actually are, of what fixtures we have in the current library. Pixel map layers do not need to be patched. Those are fine to leave unpatched. Um, Right, where, where quantity was entered, there was a grade outnumbered. Ah, so in the fixture schedule, next to where you type in where your number is, that grayed out number is the DMX footprint so that you can actually know how many channels that fixture is going to take up. We will go through auto palettes. Set is to the left of the number one button on that front panel. Or 
If you see Noah has his P not hog four PC in map mode by hitting control. I think it's control Q toggles map mode. Um, then you can hit the uh, I button to bring up set as well. Or insert. Just double check that. We do not have a list of what to patch for this show. We can add one later and that same link you got will be updated. Yeah, in that show file that is in the, the folder that you should got an email with, it already has everything patched in. It's already got some basic stuff done, so you can follow along. This first video is going to be just kind of getting it all started, uh, but that show file you have should already have everything patched and pretty much ready to go. Um, so you don't have to worry about like keeping up with us. Um, and no, there is not a functional difference between desk channels and dimmers. They are still one channel from zero to 100%. Just helps clean up your patch when you use auto palettes which we will go over auto palettes. Cool. Um, so now that we kind of talked about that, let's go ahead and do some patching and get some fixtures patched in. So to patch some fixtures, we'll just go, we'll go through a couple together and then we're gonna let Noah do his thing and get the rest of the rig patched again. So we're gonna start with the spot 2000s. To patch them, you have to select the user numbers. That's when you start using that numeric kind, that numeric keypad. So type in one through nine, to select the fixtures and then press the at button. When you press at, it's going to open this fixture patch window. This fixture patch window, you can then say what DMX processor you're patching to. So what deep DP you're patching to, which there's only one in our show. So we'll just click on one. And then you say what universe you're going to patch to. Um, so we're going to click in universe one and then hit one enter. So one's the starting address. So that's why I hit one enter. And then that gets all the spot 2000s patch. So now we have them patched to universe one, address one, and then they just go sequentially from there. The console knows how many DMX channels each fixture takes. So we just follow right at one right after another because we selected them in the range. So now we're going to hit, uh, so now we're going to do the wash 2000s. Usually between patching, best practice is to hit clear. That way you don't accidentally double select fixtures. So let's select our wash 2000. So 101 through 118 and then at. Now, again, it's going to bring up this fixture patch window. We're going to click on DMX2 because these are going to go into universe two. And then we're going to, they start at address one. So hit one, enter. And when that happens, we get a resolve patching conflict error. Um, so basically all this is saying is all the fixtures that we've selected don't fit on this universe that we want to patch to. What do we want to do? Do we want to continue patching onto universe three or not patch? Um, so we're going to say, yes, we want to continue patching on universe three. And it would be the next available universe if you're not patching from two to three. And you'll see these last four fixtures now get patched into universe three, starting at address one. And while that, and so that's really how patching happens. So I'm going to let Noah go through and patch the rest. And Noah, you should explain command line syntax. Sure. Uh, let's do this. So to patch directly to an address, uh, you, we're doing all these in a range just because they all are sequential. Uh, but if you wanted to patch to directly to an address, I'm going to say 201 through 207. It's 201 through 207. I'm going to hit at. Uh, and then the next address I'm going to put this at is going to be universe three, address 145. So if you want to patch directly to an address and not just take up the next available address, you can type it in uh, three, so that's the universe and then slash, and then 145, and that denotes the address you want to start at. And there you go. They've been patched from uh, universe three, address 145, and then, of course, all being patched sequentially after. Okay. Really quickly. So when you're inside, so there's a question here about the DMX footprint. Can it be changed when patching or does it default to the max attributes? Uh, there are separate fixtures for you to choose from. So in the fixture schedule, like for Shapeshifter, there's several different modes, or solo, wa solo, solo wash 19s, there's three different modes. You have reduced, standard, and mapping. 
for example. Um, so I would, if I didn't want to take up all, all the channels possible to do pixel mapping, I could choose the reduced mode, and that's going to have a different DMX footprint. So you just find the proper mode inside the fixture schedule that you want to schedule there. You you don't actually change which fixture what you don't change it based on the fixture type. It'll all the different modes will be listed there that we have in the fixture schedule. I'm going to steal this for a second. Uh, just one thing I'd like to point out is there. I'm going to unpatch these fixtures so you can see how it's unpatched. Uh, so the same thing. You select the fixture. It's going to say one through nine. Press enter. Then there's an unpatch button at the top of the screen. They'll just unpatch the fixtures. So all this patching that we've done has all been done sequentially. There is a way that you can do what's called gap and offset, which is one of my favorite features of the console. Uh, if you saw the, with the way that these were patched originally. Uh, the patch point uh, that the console did all the map for automatically goes uh, address 1, address 44, 87, 130, 173. Uh, if you hand that off to an electrician and say, hey, they're 43 channels apart, you'll probably make a mistake and mispatch your fixtures if they're like in a row. So something that I like to do a lot of times, I'm going to unpatch these again, is I like to patch with what's called an offset. So I'm going to say 1 through 9. And I'm going to say at, I'm going to choose my destination. So I'm going to say one slash one. So that says start at universe one, address one. And then I'm going to press at again. And if you look at the command line, it now says gap. If I type in a number now, it'll allow me to specify a number of addresses to leave empty. But if I press at one more time, so three ats total, it will give offset on my command line. And if I type in 50, enter. Take a look at how my fixtures are patched now. They're actually patched uh, 151, 101, 151, 201, which is a lot easier to do the math in your head for. So if you have a row of fixtures and you just say, hey, they're 50 channels apart, uh, you can hand it off to your electrician and you don't have to let them like do all the math or take their phone out and have to calculate all that. So little handy tool, I always like to, to showcase that. Uh, since our rig is actually patched sequentially, I'm going to unpatch them again and then repatch them sequentially. Right. Uh, so now that our fixtures are actually patched, we can actually connect to the visualizer. Uh, you can't connect to the visualizer if you don't actually have anything in your show file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and close this window. And I'm going to double click on the hog for logo to open up this menu. Go to the network window. And then there should be a process that says visualizer. If you don't see this process, it's because you have to enable it at the start screen. Uh, so you have to log out of your show, go into settings and enable the visualizer stream. Right click here, hit settings. Now you can see that screen and it should, because capture is really awesome, it should automatically detect it. Uh, it should find the IP address if you're running on the same machine and I'll just going to press OK. Now we should be able to turn our fixtures on and there they are. Cool. Now that we got the visualizer selected, let's go back into fixture window for me, Noah, and let's talk about auto palettes. Um, so we had a question about going over auto palettes, which we were actually planning on doing. So let's go. So inside the fixture window at the top toolbar, there's an auto palettes button. Um, before, so what auto palettes will do is when, when it gets clicked, we know this pop-up will come up and it's going to ask us to make default groups. So make groups based on our fixture types. Um, and then you have maximum group repeat. That's how many groups do we want to split? How many times do we want to split the group or the fixture type? Uh, make note groups, which we'll show an example of. But what this basically does is in that note column in the fixture window, if you put a note in there, we will automatically generate some groups based on that note. So let's go do that with the source fours for me. The first nine, we're going to click and drag and then hit set to actually put change the text there are going to be the front light. And then the last nine are going to be the back light. Cool. And then let's click, go back into auto palettes now that we have those put in. And once auto palettes are clicked, we also can make some, some palettes by default. Um, intensity and position palettes, they will make by default, but the important ones that I like to point out are the color palettes and the beam palettes. 
your color palettes are going to be a uh, your color palettes are going to give you just default generic mixed color palettes so red green blue white cyan magenta yellow and then it's going to also go through your color wheel on each of the light and create palettes for each of the slots on the color wheel now if that color we if that color like if you have red on color wheel one on fixture a and then red on color wheel two on fixture b without separate by wheel those get just put into the same palette so with separate by wheel checked it actually gets you two separate pal it's two separate palettes for each red because they're on two separate wheels um, and that goes the same for the beam palettes which will get you some gobo palettes um, so go ahead and hit generate you start them and then close and then go to palettes and that's going to open our window um, and if you notice, so we have a bunch of groups here, but they're not very they're not lined up correctly. That is because we our alignment spacing was not set correctly. What's also cool about auto palettes is that you can just regenerate them, and it's not going to make duplicate palettes. It's just going to allow us to redo those specific palettes. So we're going to change that to fifteen, and then hit generate. And now, if we open up palettes again, it'll change. And there we go. And then if we scroll down a little bit in the group directory those are the two the backlight and the front light are the two palettes that we made based on are the two groups that we made based on the notes uh noah why don't you take it over on selecting fixtures yeah so to do just about anything you gotta select your fixtures tell them what to do what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna open up the programmer window just so we can see what is selected programmer will always just show us what's selected I'm also going to enable a thing called highlight. What highlight does is it takes my currently selected fixtures and just turns them on. This will be good because we can also see kind of how the rig looks. So you should be able to see the visualizer on screen right now. Uh, so to select fixtures, you just type in the number. So if I wanted to select fixture number five, five, and hit enter, and I select fixture number five, because of highlight, it just came on. You can also select a range of fixtures. So if I say one through nine, enter, I've selected all nine of our solo spots. There's also a thing called um, open-ended selection. So if I type in one through and I just press enter, really handy tool is it actually just stops at fixture number nine automatically. We don't have a fixture number 10 in the show file. Uh, and if there was a fixture number 10, but it was a different type, it would actually stop at fixture number nine. So this is really handy. I really just need to know the first number of my ranges so that I can select fixtures. Uh, you can also subtract out. So if I said one through nine minus five, enter, it would subtract out a fixture, say fixture number five. And also add in fixtures. So if I said one plus six, enter, select the first and the sixth fixture. Uh, so that's to select things from the command line. You can also select things from groups. So I'm going to move this window over and I'm going to open up that group directory. So these are the auto-generated groups that we generated a few moments ago because of auto palettes. So I can hit all fixtures and all the lights come on. Uh, you can also select fixtures from type. So if I say all soil spot, it's basically the same thing as selecting uh, fixtures one through nine. And then auto palettes is really cool because it actually does your uh, every other fixture. So this would be my odd fixtures, my even fixtures, and the, you can do it in segments of three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera. We just did segments of up to three. So the first of every third segment, the second of every third or second of every three segments, and the third of the segments. And that's done by fixture type. So if I went to say the solo frames, I could select a whole different type of fixtures from here as well. There's also a really handy tool called the select toolbar. So I'm going to select my solo spots. And then at the bottom, there's a soft key that says select. And then on these soft keys, you have a bunch of different options. So if I wanted to select my even fixtures, it doesn't actually select the evens. It actually just selects every other, kind of like that group earlier. A good way of selecting fixtures that way. And I can even select, say, the evens of my evens. You can also, so if I say select odd, you can also do a select invert as well. So like maybe you want to do a red, blue color wash. You could select uh, every other fixture, make that color change, and then hit select. Then there's the invert button, and it would invert my selection around from what I had previously selected. Uh, there's a bunch of other different tools in the select toolbar as well. There's some stuff that deals with your selection order, which we'll talk about 
later, but your selection order is important when it comes to fanning and offsetting various different functions. Cool. Now that we have kind of, kind of the basics of fixture selections, let's talk a little bit about dotted user numbers. Uh, so let's just right off the back without changing dotted user numbers. Can you select the all LED bar for me? That group. Uh, so the all LED bar group, these are compound fixtures. A compound fixture is a type of fixture that is made up of other fixture types. So with the uh, so with the dotted fixture numbers, what we can quickly do to select the first cells is just hit dot one enter. Now to select the last cells, you hit dot eight enter. And now to select all the cells, we can just quickly hit dot dot enter. Now we've selected all the cells. So the dotted user numbers gives us quick access around fixtures that have those dotted numbers in them. Um, what is what I really like about dotted user numbers is you don't have to actually apply this to just compound fixtures. So the LED bars are the simplest compound fixtures, but you can also apply this to other fixture types. So like our UNOS, for example, uh, can go ahead and select the UNOS for me, Noah. Mm -hmm. our, our UNOS, for example, are broken up in sections of five. So there's not really an easy way right now to just say, Grab me the first cell of each of, or sorry, not the first cell. Grab me the first fixture of each section. Um, so we can actually make that happen by using the dotted user numbers. So let's go back into that fixture window. And then go to the UNOs and select all the UNOs um, user numbers for me. And then hit set. And when we hit set, what we can do is actually give it a syntax that's going to say what's our starting user number and then how many dotted user numbers do we have before we increase that that whole number so we're going to say 301.1 is our starting user number slash five which is how many parts we have and then enter so now that's going to give us 301.1 3.5 and so on now go ahead and close that fixture window for me, Noah. And now if we just want to grab the first fixture in each section, hit dot one enter. And now we have that first fixture selection. And then dot five enter. And that gets us our last fixture in that section. And so by using the dotted user numbers, we can really jump around in this way. Um, so I forgot who mentioned it in the chat, but one of you guys wanted to know how to do different colors based on your, uh, with dotted fixture numbers, Alan did, with uh, his desk channels. So basically you could just say your dot ones are all your blues, your dot twos are all your greens, your dot four, uh, threes are all your reds. And then you could make your dot fours all the whites if you don't have any gel in there. So then you could just quickly select just one fixture is gonna grab that whole bank of all the different colors just by hitting 301 enter for our example that grabs the first section um, and then you could also if you hit and then to grab all the blues you just quickly hit dot one enter and that's going to grab all the blues or that would in our case that's going to grab all the first cells so hopefully that helps answer how to use that way Somehow, someone has unmuted themselves. It will grab dot one of every compound fixture in the rig if I have them selected first. So like if I hit dot one, so you have to have first all the fixtures selected. So like in this case, we have, so if we hit all dot all fixtures and then dot one enter, that grabs the dot one of all the fixtures in the first rig. So it's all, it's like, uh, so it's all based on what fixtures you have selected. So, but yes, there were, so hope, so that's how the dot ones can also be, be work. Yes, we are just so you guys are aware. Um, and can, so just so you guys are aware, this is recorded already. 
Um, so you can go back and rewatch the segment. It'll be up after we're done. And just to help make sure about the echo stuff, like if it's feedback from another person, make sure uh, make sure that everyone's on mute right now, uh, just so that we don't get other feedback. And I'll try to make sure I'm not echoing as much locally on my end. Cool. Uh, any other th question? Any questions about what we've been over? I see there's some questions in here. We're gonna go back to it. We're gonna we're gonna we also have a dedicated Q and A section at the end. Uh, at the end of this as well. So now, so no, why don't you go over opening other fixtures as well? Because we kind of talked about the menu system, but not really anything else. Yeah, so to open a window, there's several ways to open a window. Uh, so there's literally five ways. So what I talked about earlier was the menu system. So if you double click or you press and hold on a touch screen, you can open up a menu. Depending on where you click or press determines what size it opens up in. So if I click in the middle, it opens up full size. That's my favorite way. It's always the way I recommend people that are beginners to learn just because everything is right there in front of you. The other way is to uh, either press setup or open. So on the front panel, uh, there's two keys. We have the setup key. And what that does is that switches your soft keys to that row of keys here at the bottom to allow for uh, other windows that you can open. So if I hit setup and I hit say network, it would open up the network window. There's also the open key. Open, you always actually have to hold. So if I hold open and I can press another window here, so I can use saturation window, a programmer window. So that's another way to open up various different windows. You can also double tap several buttons. So if I double tap, say, position or color, it'll open up the corresponding window as long as it you know, makes sense. And of course, I always recommend using these. Views are your friends. So that's what these little buttons here at the top of the screen are. If you press it, it recalls those windows that's recorded to that view. Uh, so these are all preset views. I usually go in and usually make my own because depending on what kind of console I'm on, they can be modified and be slightly different. Uh, so you can record those. So if I wanted to record a view of, say, my color directory here and in my color picker here, my media picker here, and maybe some groups. I could record this as a view really easily. All I do is I hold down record, I touch on the view toolbar there, and I can throw that view on. If I double tap set, I can quick name it. And so if I wanted to call this, you know, color, it's O-U-R, even though we're American, uh, you can recall that window. What's really handy is there's a shortcut for all of that. So I'm going to close all my windows. And if I open up that first view, that palettes view, uh, lots of these uh, functions that are here on the right, there's a shortcut for. So for example, copy is open at, or sorry, open slash. Uh, my favorite is close open backspace. It's really handy when you're opening a window, you want to make some changes and you don't need that window anymore. So you can open backspace to close that window. Uh, a really, really handy tool, though, is if you hold open and you press any of the numbers on the number pad, you can open up that corresponding view. So if I hold open and I press the number one, it opens up my first view, open two, three, four, all the way up to view number 10. Uh, so if I open view seven, there you go. Very quickly, I just recalled that uh, window really quickly. I personally like to have a blank view, so I'll record view 10. And I'll call that uh, close all. And why that's really handy is that if I have windows open and I'm doing a bunch of stuff and I want to like just refresh, open and zero would recall that view, which is empty, and I close all my windows. So once again, several ways to open windows. You can press setup or hold open. You can double tap the corresponding key on the actual front panel, uh, or you can use the menu system, or you can, of course, use a view that you've recorded previously. You know what, real quick, what keyboard are you using right now? What keyboard am I using? Are you I'm using the Hoglet? Uh, I'm using both. Okay. What do you mean? Sorry, you, there were a couple questions asking what you were typing in on. Uh, I have an actual Hoglet underneath me. Uh, then I also have an external keyboard that's connected as well. Yeah. Sorry, that was just a question I've seen a couple times. 
there is a, a, a keyboard that you can purchase. It's called the uh, Command Key Keyboard. And so it's a USB device, but it's just a custom keyboard that has all of our uh, various different functions on there. It doesn't have faders and it doesn't have parameters, but if you're used to like command line syntax, it might be really handy. Uh, you could find that online from High Output, which is one of our dealers. Um, awesome. Thanks for thanks for answering that. I knew that you had there as well. Had it there as well. I just didn't know um, which one you were using today. Um, so someone mentioned Hog Four Remote is great too. It is good unless you're unless you're on Hog Four PC and you don't have a Nomad key or a Hoglet attached, and then you can't, um, and then you can't control faders or encoder wheels um, with that. Um, the command key keyboard is third party made by high output, but the hoglet is made by high end systems. It's, a, it's supposed to be partnered either with rec or with, um, or with your hog four PC so that you have your control with your wings and your programming section. Um, with that said, let's keep, let's keep going and actually talk about controlling fixtures a bit since we just talked about views. Um, so to, so to control fixtures, let's go ahead and open that palette view for me, Noah. So just a brief overview of controlling fixtures, and then we'll get into a little bit, a little bit bigger, uh, discussion about it as well. Uh, but just an overview is to control fixtures. The easiest way is you select the group that you want to control. So if we want to control the spot 2000s, so we click on the spot 2000s, we have them selected, and then you can. Use your numeric keypad to specify the intensity you want to go to. So by using either the at button or to just bring them to 100%, hit the full button. Go ahead and just hit full, and that's going to in and that's going to make them come on. And then you have you go to your fixed kind keys, and these are what type of parameters you want to control. So if you want to change their position, just hit the position button, and then you'll see that the third encoder wheels tilt, so you can tilt. Them downstage, and then you can use that second encoder wheel for pan. I mean, that's generally how all the all the functions are controlled. You select that, but you select the type of parameter you want to control with your fixed kind keys, and then you go find that parameter. Now, sometimes different uh, different types have more wheel sets available. So, like if you go to um, if you go to Beam, for example, here. You can see when you hit beam, there's a lot of different options here, and then you keep hitting beam, you'll keep getting different options on your encoder wheels. And just to point out that slot toolbar that I kind of talked about a little bit that said it changes based on the fixtures that you have selected, right there at the right above your encoder wheel toolbar, you can see where it says strobe, color, gobo, gobo 2, prism, pr uh, beam effects, and beam effects 2. These are all the different slotted parameters for that fixture type. So in that fixture top, so by hitting prism, we can quickly just jump in and say, hey, we want that three facet prism, or we want that linear prism. We can quickly say we want color wheel red to go. Um, so those are just the different slotted parameters that we can adjust. Noah, do you want to walk through controlling the fixtures a bit more in depth? Uh, yeah, one thing I always like to mention is that there's a couple different uh, color models in HOG. So the first model is the hue saturation model. This deals with fixtures that actually mix colors. So if your fixture only has like a slot of color, so different actual slots on a wheel that's, that move around, it wouldn't count towards that method. So uh, there is a little window you can open uh, called the color picker. You'd find it in your color directory. You can open it through by holding open. This is the first method. So I'm gonna actually make my lights go white. Really easy, just click on the screen. And you could decide where what color your fixtures need to go. Uh, hue is where you are on the circle. So that's in degrees. So zero degrees at the very top would be red, 120 would be green, et cetera, et cetera. And then saturation is how far from the middle. So 0% saturation would be white, 100% would be as deep of a color as you can get. Now you can control that on the uh, encoder display as well, or on the encoders. So if I go to color, You'll see that the first two parameters are hue and saturation. So once again, saturation is how far from the middle, and the hue is where you are on the actual circle. There's another color model, uh, which is the CMY model. 
So if you prefer to operate in a three-point color system using cyan, magenta, yellow, you can use that as well. I prefer hue and saturation just because the color picker is hue and saturation. And then another model is the actual slot model. So what I'll do is I'm going to clear out my color information. This is what Megan was talking about earlier. These are actual slotted colors. So if I go to color, the second page of color, the fourth encoder wheel, this is an actual wheel of color that I can choose, which is really nice because you can do a lot of split colors. I like the purple and orange personally. Uh, and you can also do like a spin with this. So if you look on your encoder display, there's a couple of different modes for this parameter. So you have slot, spin, and random. Uh, so slot is what I just did, where exactly on the wheel you want it to go. If you give it a spin, you'll see it says zero RPM. If I start wheeling this up, you'll see if the wheel starts spinning here. Kind of slowly, let me see if I go a little faster here. Too fast. Uh, what's really cool about this as well is that you can uh, invert your rotation. So something that I like to do a lot of times is I'll select my like even fixtures. So in my group directory, I selected my even fixtures, uh, and I will hold down minus, and then if I spin that wheel the other direction, it'll take the those fixtures and invert, but keep the same speed. So my fixtures are still spinning the same speed, but just every other fixture is going in the opposite direction. And that works for just about any kind of parameter that has a positive or negative value. Also works for things like pan and tilt. So I'm gonna press clear. If I say, put my fixtures, pan them over. If I hold minus once again, and I spin that encoder it inverts my pan positive and negative and that works on just about any parameter that has a positive and a negative value. All right. Uh, that's something that I like to just personally point out. There's also the plus key uh, that kind of works well with minus. So if I tell my pictures to go full, if I hold down plus and I'm actually doing this on the keyboard and I spin an encoder, so I'm going to hit the tilt encoder, it'll actually go to the highest value of tilt, which in this case is 135 degrees. If I spin it to the left, it will go to the lowest value of tilt, which is negative 135 degrees. If I want to set it back to a default value, that's where period comes in. So if I hold down period and I spin tilt, it'll go to zero degrees of tilt. So if I need to reset a value, I can also do that with the kind key. So the, the four keys at the top of the console, intensity, position, color, and beam, you can set those parameters as well. So if I say pick a color and pick a gobo, something like that, Pick a position. If I hold down period, I press say position, it will reset all position values, all color values, in values, intensity. So that's just a way that you can modify fixtures and set them back to a base value pretty quickly. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to mention, guys, is the little silver button. Something I I personally love, and I don't see a lot of programmers always use, is there's a little silver button on the console, so you don't see it on this virtual display, but if you have a physical console, it's on all the encoder wheels. Uh, by default, what that does is it takes that parameter and adjusts it by one. So where that is really useful is for things that are slotted, like say a gobo. So if I press this little silver button, you'll see that I'm punching through one, what's called a real world value of gobo. So I'm actually punching through my various different gobos here. Now, for something like pan and tilt, it's nice because I can keep pressing it and it goes up by one value. I can also hold down pig, which is kind of like our shift key, and that also enables it to go really slowly. I can get what's called finer control. But what I like to do a lot of times is I like to remap that silver button. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close all my windows, go into the preferences window. And then in the preferences window, there is the programming tab. And there's the encoder wheel button options. Very, very, very important feature. And instead of it being adjust by one, I'm going to change it to be set. I'll press OK. Now, what that does is that if I type in my fixtures, so I'm going to select my fixtures, and if I type in a value, I'm going to say press that silver button, and I can type in a value for tilt. So I'm going to say 90, enter, and it'll go to exactly 90 degrees. You can also do a range with that. So I'm going to put it back to 45. So if I hit uh, on the pan encoder here and I hit that silver button, I could type in 45 and type in through 
negative 45, enter. What that'll give me is actually a fan out. I've actually fanned out those values just by typing it in. So just a little handy tool that you can use if you like to type things in. That's what I personally like. Um, anything else you want to cover, Megan, before we move on to edit fixtures? No, I think you should just take it away to edit fixtures. We'll probably touch on fanning in a, I think the next video we're planning on touching more on fanning. Video fanning. So if you didn't quite catch that syntax or want more explanation, next Thursday we are going to explain exactly how that syntax works. And then you can also watch the video again. Really quickly, I'll show you just again one more time. So that silver button, I mapped it to the set key. And if I press that silver key, I can type in what I want. So this time I'm going to say 30 through we'll do 90 pan. And it takes from 30 degrees pan on my first selected fixture all the way to 90 degrees of pan on my last selected fixture. Uh, you can also do that from the encoder wheel as well. So if I hold fan, I'm going to reset my positions. So if I wanted to fan these parameters, you could do that really easily from the encoder wheel. So what I'm doing is there's a fan key at the bottom of your front panel, I'm holding that down and I'm spinning that correlated uh, wheel. A uh, really great way to make, say, a uh, fan of color, maximize your saturation, hold down fan and spin hue. Now I've got myself a little bit of a rainbow type thing going on here. I'm going to move it over a little bit. And there you go. There's a good fan of colors. We're going to talk about that. There's several ways to do it, uh, but that'll probably be more focused in the next video. Um, and for those of you, so, sorry, not to cut you off. Yeah, um, for those of you without a hog four in front of you, um, can can you go to the front panel view real quick? So the front front panel is it looks a little bit different than hog four PC, but if you have a hoglet or hog four console in front of you, there's going to be little silver buttons right underneath the encoder wheel. So there's one for each encoder wheel. Um, and the default now is adjust by one, and that's actually my favorite default option here, um, where it's adjust by one, where you hit the button and it literally increases by one DMX value or one real world value, depending on the parameter, uh, because that's the only one that doesn't have a shortcut key on it. Um, but yeah, so that's that's just where the silver silver button is in case you are not you're just following along and don't have a console in front of you. With that being said, no, why don't you take us to why you like to edit fixtures? Yeah, so I, you know, I talk with a lot of programmers and they always come up to me and they say, you know, how can I be a better programmer? What can I do to be faster, shortcuts, things like that? One of the things that I always talk about is learn how to manage editing your fixtures. So uh, most parameters have a default value. Let's go ahead and switch this back over to this view here. So if you look on the visualizer, what I did is I told uh, my solo spots, I told them to come on in full. So I'm say one through nine at full. And where they're at right now, position-wise, is just aiming straight down. And that's really not super useful to me. Uh, it might be in a couple of situations, but for the most part, really not so much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tilt my fixtures up a little bit. And I can see that maybe that is a more useful position to me. And I might want to set that as my default position. So if I look at my encoder display, I'll see that I've got a tilt value of about 40 degrees. There's a way that you can set that as your default value. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into that fixture window. And I'm going to go into edit fixtures. There's a little button on the top of the screen here called edit fixtures. And I can set various different functions for each fixture. If I hit sort by function, it'll sort it by the actual parameter. And I can go to, say, the tilt value. And I can set my default tilt. And I hit set and type in 40 enter. And now my default value for tilt is going to be 40 degrees. So that way, when I press clear, I turn my fixtures on. They're already at that value, which is really handy. And I don't have to worry about having to tilt them up or pan them up. Another good thing that's useful for is things like zoom and focus. So I'm going to select my solo washes, tell them to go to full. Oops. Now I, I could also set a default tilt for that, but these are wash fixtures. The default zoom for uh, wash or for any fixture is 50%. 
Anytime I have a wash fixture, I like to set the default zoom to 100%. So it's all just a big wide wash. Uh, another example of what I like to do uh, default fixtures for is the focus parameter. So a lot of times I will turn a fixture on and I'll put a gobo in. And it's not focused to that gobo. So a lot of times I will find that focus value. I want to focus this. Granted, capture won't be super accurate, but there you go. I find that like 84% is a better focal point. So I will go into my edit fixtures and I'll set that as my default value for focus. It just makes me a faster program. I don't have to do all those extra steps over and over again if my fixtures are already at that point. So someone is asking about uh, when you have fixtures that are hung 90 degrees off on radius truss. So there is a function in edit fixtures called offset. So what you could do is for say pan or tilt, if your fixtures are 90 degrees offset, you can put in a value either plus or minus 90 and that'll put the fixture degree wise in the right orientation. Uh, but that does have to be done through this window. Well, and with that being done, I think we should transition into some dedicated Q&A. Yeah, so if you guys have any questions, uh, it could be kind of whatever you want. Once again, this live stream was really intended to be a basic introduction to the console. We are going to do about 10 of these total. So, uh, you know, do tune in every Thursday. They are recorded. So if you can't attend the live stream, you can't ask questions in, in person, uh, you can view the videos uh, after the live stream has been recorded. Um, there will also be a survey at the end, so if you guys are going to go ahead and leave, uh, there's a survey, so if you have any questions or you have any um, comments or you want to see something specific, let us know and we'll try to squeeze it into uh, the various live streams that we have. Um, so real quick, this video will be in study, so just so you guys know, um, if you're going to duck out for this live Q&A, thanks so much for watching. Make sure to find, you'll find this video at study hall um so at etcconnect.com and then navigate to study hall and you'll find all these videos here and you'll find the next where to sign up for the next next week's webinar which is how to wrangle the programmer like i said i believe that's when we're going to talk about fanning and all that good stuff some more tips and tricks while programming which is always nice which is always nice um yeah uh Cool. Let's let's get to some questions. I know one of you. I know some one of I saw there was a question versus to use CMY versus HSI. So you set. Uh, do you want to take this one, or do you want me to take this? One? Uh, yeah. So it, it really comes down to personal preference. So they do kind of work together, but they are not actually the same. A lot of people think that Q saturation just very freely translates to CMY. There's a lot of color theory as to why that's the case or why it's actually not the case. So I prefer hue and saturation because I prefer just having two points of control and to go back and modify everything. So what I'm talking about, press clear, one through nine at full. I'll also show you what I can see here. Oops, wrong one. So the first color model is, is hue and saturation. That follows under the color picker. I prefer this model just because I like to, I just prefer to work in sort of, it's also known as XY kind of. Uh, I decide how deep of a color I want, the saturation, that second wheel, and where I want that color to be specifically. Um, you can record uh, with both. What I do recommend a lot of programmers is that you pick a color model and you stick to it. Uh, the main reason for that is it gets into tracking and some other functions and that is if you're transferring from hue saturation to cmy or cmy to hue saturation it might take a path that you don't like so that's why i recommend that you just pretty much pick a color model and you stick to it um, there is also a third color model which is the green blue color model it's not available for all fixtures uh, especially fixtures that don't actually have red green blue emitters so i generally don't recommend that folks use it unless you really want to Cool. And I like Noah said, just going to reiterate, choose one color model, choose one color space and stick with it. Because if you don't, then you could see some adverse, some, some going, like going and snapping to white before actually color mixing. Or maybe if you were using 
eye red, eye green, eye blue, and you go to color mix, there's no intensity. So I would just make sure you know how you're programming. Uh, Ryan asked a, a good question, and uh, basically he says, uh, how does show files transfer from console to console? So uh, show files can transfer from console to console freely as well as hog for PC. There are limitations on software versions. Usually, or you can always go forward in software. You can always update to a newer version. Uh, generally, you can't always go back. Uh, as it stands right now, you can actually go all the way back to 3.9. Uh, software versions, which was August a year and a half ago, but generally you can only go forward. Uh, there is one thing you mentioned about macros, however. So if you're going from one size desk to another size desk, so like a Roadhog to a full bore, uh, if you do uh, touchscreen macros, uh, they don't always translate because they're different size touchscreens. There's an X and Y system involved there. A big thing that I recommend is try to use your keys as much as possible. So if you touch, say, color palette 13, don't touch color palette 13, actually type in color 13 and record that into your macro. That way, no matter what console you're on, the macro does translate pretty well. There's also a function called comment macros, which we're gonna talk about in a future video, but comment macros can solve a lot of various different things that a lot of people try to do with keystroke macros. Um, and then I know that there was one in there about views, like switching views, like if you record a view on a Roadhog and a Hedgehog, What's the best way to go between those view between what's the best way? Like, if you're setting up a road hog. A show on a road hog, how do you, what's the best way to set it up to be more expandable on other consoles? Like you show up and there's a hedgehog now instead. Do you have any tips on that? Noah? So, something that I have done is there's multiple pages of views. So if you uh, don't know what console you're going to be on, you can do a, say, the first 10 for a hedgehog, the next 10 for a roadhog, the next for a full bore, et cetera, et cetera. And then you just update them on site. So a lot of times, you know, I, I preset my views and I kind of know what I want them to be. Usually my first two are my palette views for programming, my views three and four for running effects, four and five are, or sorry, five and six are usually for playback scenes and cue lists and things like that. Just update them when you walk into the, the show or to the show site. It doesn't take maybe five minutes to kind of just get them arranged. Um, you might have to resize your buttons around and, um, you know, make them small, medium, or large, et cetera, et cetera. But if you want, you can uh, copy those views to an additional set of views. And if you're going from console to console, you don't know what you're going to have, what flavor of the night, you can just go to whichever page you want. Um, something when I'm back in the office and I'm able to have all the consoles in front of me, we should go through and make a resource available of maybe a support article that says, hey, this is how many buttons across on each console it is. Right. Um, that, so we'll, once we're able to get back in the office and get in front of the consoles to make sure we're doing the proper numbers across, we can also make a resource available to everyone that those buttons are that that way you know what buttons are across when you're making your views and you can do that a little bit better from console to console uh he was asking about keyboard shortcuts so you can print this off online or online manual so if you go into the help button here uh you can find this on a web browser pretty easily you scroll all the way down to the bottom somewhere there's uh chapter 31 is cheat sheets and then there's the qwerty keyboard shortcuts. So here is all of your shortcuts for uh, Hog4 PC. Uh, you do have to enable it. So if you want to toggle the shortcuts, the command for that is Control Q. Um, and there's also another one, scroll walk will also do it as well. Um, you can also click on the screen. There's an, either an ABC or a map button, and that'll allow you to switch between being a normal QWERTY ABC keyboard to being a Hog4 PC keyboard. Uh, I did also have, let me see if I can bring that up, a link to that command key keyboard. Unfortunately, there's not a picture, uh, but they do make uh, USB keyboards for both the EOS uh, family of consoles as well as our family of consoles. Um. I'm on the website right now. One's been answered. 
how do you set? So when we talk about setting up for a console from console one to so like from a hog four PC to a hog, we generally mean we're just taking our show file from console to console. We're not take so to, whenever we're setting up on hog four PC for like a hedgehog, then we'll just make sure the windows are all in the right. The windows have the right no, number of buttons across, or at least that's how I like to do it. To do it is make sure my windows have the right number of buttons across, and then make sure that I'm in nano mode when I launch hog four PC. Because then that gives me the four encoder wheels and all that good stuff. So it more so matches that. Um, um, a couple of y'all came in late and you were asking how to connect the visualizer. So currently, as it's set up, you can run them on two separate machines or you can run them all on the same machine. Uh, you do need to be up to date on your Hog4 PC software. So to uh, map the visualizer, it's really straightforward because Capture is awesome with CITP. You do need to run that visualizer first. You need to go into your network window, right click on this visualizer stream and hit settings. Let me show you the actual view here. And then it should automatically detect that um, visualizer running on your computer. Uh, if you do not see this visualizer stream, it's because you need to enable uh, the visualizer stream. That's done from the start screen. So where you go to log into your show, launch existing show, uh, launch new show, there's a settings button. And we hit that settings button, there's a button that says run visualizer stream. And that's where you would go to get this option to enable the visualizer. Uh, if you also are wondering about why we only have one uh, screen, there's not two screens. Most people, when they download Hot 4 PC, they see two screens. That's because we also enabled nano mode, and that's found in the same place from the start screen. Um. Another question here, patch and universe is an additional DP. The only way to get more universes out of a Roadhog 4. Yes, um, so a DP. So if you max out your universes on your console, the only way to get more, this applies to any consoles around, along the range is to actually add in a DMX processor to your network. Um, so DP 8000 is a DMX processor. It adds 16 universes of control. Um, so that's for Hedgehog 4X and above. The base model Hedgehog 4 does not allow for expansion via DP 8000s. Um. Uh, Matilda asks, is there planned in the future to make new hotkeys? I think they are really different to remember since I always wanted to hit T for three, for example. Um, I feel your pain a little bit. Uh, Best, once again, best place to put in feature requests is on our forums page. Uh, I will say that you can very easily get USB mappable keyboards and you can map that keyboard to be whatever you want that key to be. So if you get a five by five grid, you can map it to whatever sort of arrangement that you want. Um, I use a gaming keyboard at my desk at uh, work and I've got a couple of different um, mappable keys on the side and on the top that I use to very quickly navigate the console. Um, so Kim says, how are pallets affected if you add fixtures to your show file upon arriving on sh on site? Ah, I love that you have the fixture window open um, because this is how they're affected. So if you just add to your fixture count and your fixture schedule, they're not going to get added into your pallets unless it's a global or per type pallet. Um, now, if you to get the now, so that doesn't count for anything in a per fixture pallet, meaning it only applies to those fixtures selected and it doesn't take into account anything that's been programmed already, like queues or scenes. Um, so if you want to get those fixtures added into those queues, scenes, and palettes, then you can actually hit, so you'll, you'll select the fixture that you want. So, ah, sorry, guys. Um, there's a feature called Replicate Fixtures. And what that'll do is that'll take the currently selected fixture and copy it into all the fixture palettes um, and into all the queues and scenes. So basically all of your recording that you've already done. Um, it copies all the programming, all that kind of stuff. So then you just need to go back and tweak your palettes as you need to. Uh, hopefully that'll help answer that. Uh, what's the simplest way to send XLR4 out to Universe 7? Currently, that is not that is not supported. Um, you own so you would need like a a widget, for example, to on the Roadhog. If you have like a Roadhog and you're trying to get that seventh universe you'll need a widget to be able to get mapped to that seven to that seventh universe. Um, whatever universes you have out of the back of the console, those line up to universes one through however many ports there are. So 
So if you're on a hedgehog, that's two universes. So that, that's the first two. Roadhog, that's the first four. Full boar, that's the first four universes. And then hog four, 418, and rat hog, those are the first eight universes. Um, We have this wonderful question of will the Roadhog 4 ever be able to get the 12 universes like the full size? Um, so that's actually the only console that does 12 universes currently is the full bore 4. And we cannot answer that question. That is way above our heads here. And I don't have an answer for it, but we can definitely poke the bear. And But I we probably won't be able to get an answer for that one, unfortunately. We're always working on new exciting things. So yeah. I tell people. I mean, did you all see the dogmented video yesterday from ETC? <laughs> um, a little bit in the chat. I have a hedgehog first gen with no external monitor. Is there a way I can get the visualizer connected to the console? Yes, you can. Um, through the fixture net port, you can. Um, it's just the so the visualizer doesn't actually run on the console. What you kind of see here in this screen share that Noah's doing is we've used some software called OBS to actually layer the visualizer on top of Hog4 PC. So the visualizer doesn't run on, on the consoles, it runs on a separate computer. Uh, but you can, so uh, because you don't have a Hognet port on that original Hedgehog, you'll have to run either uh, streaming ACN or ArtNet. So visualizer is all done through FixtureNet. Um, so the visualizer is all done through fixture net. So, but as Noah was saying, the hog net can be important to, if you wanted to do like OSC and stuff, and he was going to talk about upgrading your console. Yeah, and you can also get it upgraded. Uh, so you can get the console sent in, uh, and you can get it upgraded to a generation two, which will get you that external monitor as well as, um, the hog net port, which I would also put all the supplies. No, why don't you take this one about capture ignoring blind mode? Uh, so that would probably be more of a request for uh, capture. They would have to integrate that uh, into their software. Um, you know, best thing, once again, go onto our forms page or go on a captures page and put in that request to be able to see uh, something in blind. Um, do we have any plan? So, do we have any plan in the future, like 3D functions in future on Hog? Um, we can't really speak to it. Me and Noah are just product support specialists, so we really just know this console inside and out. So, unfortunately, for like plan type features and stuff like that, we can't really talk to at this point in time. Um, but we're like I said, like Noah said, we're always working on new and exciting things. We're always got a new a new thing that's being worked on. Um, so just hang tight and wait for those release notes. Uh, we do have a beta program. So if you want to see software early, you want to test it, or you want to give a little bit of feedback about maybe how it's arranged or how it works, or maybe even the syntax, uh, we do have a beta program. If you want to be involved in that beta program, uh, you can shoot me or Megan an email and we can get you uh, signed up. So my email is noah.allen at highend.com. You can also find it on the website under support. Uh, but yeah. Uh, check social media if you want to see what's coming out. Go to trade shows like Fair Light and Sound, US uh LBI in Las Vegas. So those are kind of the best places to see kind of what's new and what's exciting. Um, cool. So a couple more in here. So Noah, why don't you take what's the difference between adjusting offset versus default? Uh, so, yeah, how do I do that? So by setting the default, if I look at my programmer, currently I have a value of zero degrees pan and a value of 40 degrees of tilt. Okay, so that is the default value that I went in and set in that edit fixtures window. I go in and I change the offset. So I'm going to go into edit fixtures. And if I go to the soul spots sort by function 
and I'm going to set my um, my tilt, the default tilt back to zero, and then I'm going to offset it 40 degrees this time. Now I'm going to press clear, one through nine at full. Oops. Now, if you look in the programmer, uh, pan and tilt values are both zero, zero. Physically, however, that light is definitely not at zero. So what you're doing with offset is you're changing that, that actual zero point. Uh, so this is handy when you've got those fixtures that are 90 degree off. If you want all the fixtures, when you turn them on, you tilt them to just have their zero, zero point, you can adjust it um, as such. So I, I prefer not to mess with offset too often. Um, in the only case is really with the 90 degree thing with pan and tilt fixtures. I tend to just set my default value. That way I can still type in the actual value that I want. Uh, it is good though, if you've got some fixtures that are like kind of cattywampus, so like you turn your fixtures on and you've got like one fixture that's like five degrees off from the rest, even though you're seeing the same DMX value, then I can go in and actually offset and kind of adjust that fixture so it lines up better. Um, there was one, so we talked about the difference here. Um, uh, Lior is at, uh, Lior Hoffman, I don't know how to say your name correctly, uh, how to record a general effect. So in the next uh, video, we're going to talk about different palette types. Uh, so basically the short end of it is there's different types of palettes. You have a per fixture palette, you have a per type palette, and you have what's called a global palette. So if you want, you can record an effect with a global palette and it can be applied to any fixture type that fits those um, functionalities. So you can record a pan and tilt effect with just one fixture, record, put it in your effect directory, record it as a global. There's a little soft key for record global. And then you can use that to apply it towards any bit of fixture selection. Uh, global does not work when you start offsetting your fixtures around. So if you like offset your fixtures 90 degrees, you give each one a different offset, so they kind of run a wave. Uh, it, it global palette will not work in that case, but you can do a copy to function. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll write an effect for a set of fixtures, say I write an effect for six fixtures, and I want another set of those same fixtures or a different set of fixtures that are six to do the same effect. I'll say one through six, copy to 11 through 16. And that's a way of sort of taking an effect for some fixtures and applying it to others. You can copy it over. Um, we, so Alan is asking a bunch of more like advanced type things like effects and stuff like that and converting show files. We, I've added those to lists of things we need to cover. We'll probably, we'll, we will put those into a video and figure out where to put them in while we are figuring out what to do next. Um, but we'll probably cover like the best practices for merging show files, what can and can't be merged, like that kind of thing in a different video. Uh, Josh Timothy is asking about the capture show file. So you can download that for free. You don't even need a license of capture. It's an executable. Uh, that will be, uh, if you look in your email when you signed up for this live stream, there should have been a couple of like upcoming emails. And there's a link that'll say where to download that file from. And so you'll have access to the hog four show file and the capture uh, presentation file that you can access. Um, cool. And um, how do you make a nice mirror to circle effect? We will probably tackle that when we talk about effects. Uh, short answer. Unless you uh, want to do that now. Play, play with your offsets. Uh, so usually you have 180 degree offset will get you that effect. Um, it, it also it also depends on how your fixtures are oriented, whether they're uh, either continuous pan and tilt fixtures or they are not continuous. If they're aiming straight down, if they're aiming you know on the side, uh, so you really the, the practice makes perfect. So you just got to know your rig and know how the the uh, functionality of the effect is working. Uh, short answer of it, you usually just need to do a 180 degree offset on half of your fixtures, or just change your direction on the other half. 
or you could say, there's, there's more than one way to skin a hog. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, there's so there's lots of different ways, which is which is why we're also like, yes, we are doing a whole thing on effects just to a whole. We're gonna do a whole video on effects after we're kind of done more so with the with the palette with um, some of the basics like recording palettes and recording cues and stuff. But we will do a whole. We're we're gonna do a whole video on effects itself. Um. Uh, currently, only the first four videos are on the study hall. Their links are available to sign up. I'm working on getting the rest pushed into the study hall. Uh, that'll probably be done hopefully next week. So you can sign up for the next three events. You do need to sign up for each of the one by one to get the uh, access in as well as to uh, get a reminder for it. Uh, we will do something with Fixture Builder, whether it's a live video like this or it's a Hey, let's all gather around a pre-recorded video of Fixture Builder. We will, um, and then you can ask questions while the video is happening. Um, but we can, but yes, there will be something for Fixture Builder. We just got to figure out exactly how that looks. But yes, Fixture Builder is very important. We do have a YouTube video already on how to use the Fixture Builder. Um, so on us, uh, on. Um, on our YouTube page in Learn Hog 4 in the extras. It's actually my video. Um, we go through and walk through how to how to make a fixture from scratch. But then I think in this whatever we do for the next one will be how to adjust fixtures that already live in that are already inside the console and stuff like that. Um, but yes, fixture builder is definitely on the on the table. Uh, we also have a really great fixture process. So if you're not comfortable with Fixture Builder, you can always request a fixture to be built and we'll build it. Uh, we do advertise it's about a two week turnaround time. Sometimes it's much quicker than that. Actually, most of the time it's much quicker than that. So if you uh, know that you need a fixture, request it and we'll try to throw it together for you uh, pretty quickly. So uh, we're really good about that. We're really good for our user base. Uh, it's really easy to submit a fixture request. You go onto our website, go to the library, and then there's a um, basically a form you fill out, you just put your name, your email, when you need the fixture by, and a DMX chart, and then what modes you want that fixture to run in, because fixtures have several different modes. Uh, it's better for us just to build the modes that you need versus having to build all of them. It takes up a lot of our time. If you haven't seen the new fixture builder, there's a really nice newer fixture builder uh, to access as well. So the older fixture builder was a little tedious. This one, uh, there's a lot of presets and you can throw a fixture together actually really quickly. But yes, we will do that. Um, I, we can, I will add the fact that people want MIDI controllers. I don't have a MIDI controller, so that makes it really hard to show um, and do a video on. Um, but we can definitely see if we can throw something together. I know there's a bunch of, I know we have a whole lot of, um, we have a whole lot of YouTube videos, guys, that walk through how to set up visualizers and stuff like that. Um, but if you're having a specific issue, go ahead and give us an email. Uh, either you can reach out to me or Noah. It's just first name dot last name at high end dot com, or you can just email support at high end dot com, and we can definitely get you going. Um, we still uh, we're still doing support through all of this. We definitely want to make sure you guys have working rigs, especially if you're trying to get better, all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely, um, we we are still available. You can also give high end a call and we are still available to take phone calls and support and all of that. Nothing like that has changed during all of this. So please feel free to shoot us emails if you have a specific issue that you're trying to do. Uh, and a few, a couple of you are asking about uh, the visualizer still. Uh, there's a link in that. So if you got the visualizer file, one of the shortcut links in that file is a how to connect and you would follow that link. There's different uh, setups depending on if you're on PC or Mac. And if you want to run the visualizer in Hawk 4 PC versus visualizer and console running on the same PC, running to two different PCs. So there's different settings and arrangements that you can do. If you go to that link, it'll tell you all the different ways that you can do it. And so depending on what your setup is that you want to connect, you could just follow the instructions. Uh, if you still are having issues with it, shoot us an email. Uh, we can help you out. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, we are going to upload this webinar to study hall. So just make sure to keep an eye out on study hall. It'll get there pretty quickly after we're done. I'm pretty sure. Um, if not, if not, it, it'll be there sometime this week for sure. Um, well, I see you guys, some of y'all are asking for specific for specific examples, like how to record RGB faders, stuff like that, um, how to make a bump to white fader. Shoot us an email. Um, again, support at highend.com. We will get we'll take we'll shoot shoot you out how to do that. Um, we might be able to add some more if we can video it, like if we can record our screens, we might be able to add them into that link where that you downloaded the original show, the show files and stuff from so that you can see those a little bit more to review. Um, but again, we're pretty much wrapping it up now. We've kind of hit our time here. It's already 1.30. Ooh, hour and a half went by really fast. Um, so go ahead and so remember next week we have how to wrang wrangle the programmer. Uh, Noah gave a little bit of a tease with all that uh, fanning and stuff. So thanks so much guys for coming out. Make sure to check out study hall again. And then again, we are available for all kinds of support. Thanks guys. So come back, come back next week and every week after that, and you're always more welcome to call us. Um, more welcome to email us anytime. Uh, there is a survey after the webinar. So if you uh, want something specific, throw it in and we'll try to include examples of that in the future webinars that we'll be hosting. Uh, so yeah, everybody have a great, happy Thursday and remember, your hands. Well, thanks, guys. Um, if you can't see it yet to sign up for next week, it will be there. I promise you just got to wait for just wait for the link to pop up. Um, it might take a little bit time to get updated, but next week's seminar will be up there shortly. And thanks, guys. Y'all stay safe. Wash your hands, as Noah said. Um, stay home. All that good stuff. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks Bye, guys. Coming.